All right, let's do this thing. It's football happy hour and it's college football centric. Chris Hassel joined by Brady Quinn in studio. Josh Pate from our 24-7 Sports Nashville studios. The most explosive May 19th in college football history. I mean, guys, it's almost like Jimbo Fisher knew we were planning the big 100 days until college football show. This is how it all went down between Jimbo <laughs> and the guy he used to work for, Nick Saban, over the last 24 hours. Take a listen. I mean, we were second in recruiting last year. a and was first. a and bought every player on their team, made a deal for name, image, and likeness. All right, we didn't buy one player. All right, but I don't know if we're going to be able to sustain that in the future because more and more people are doing it. It's despicable that a reputable head coach could come out and say this when he doesn't get his way or things don't go his way. The narcissist in him doesn't allow those things to happen, and it's ridiculous. But when, when he's not on top, some people think they're God. Go dig into how God did his, his deal. You may find out about, about a guy that a lot of things you don't want to know. We built him up to be the czar of football. Go dig into his past or anybody that's ever coached with him. You can find out anything you want to find out, what he does and how he does it. And it's despicable. Everybody has had a take on social media after this explosion today. Brady, what's yours? Uh, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I, I think, you know, Josh has talked about this a lot. There's really no offseason anymore in any no. realm of football, NFL or college in this respect. But I, I think what Jimbo Fisher is touching on is what a lot of people have felt for a long period of time was – how the meets actually made when it's all said and done in Alabama. I think to a degree, a lot of people respect Nick Saban for the coaching job he's done. But as far as recruiting goes, they've always felt like he's had a little something extra for his recruits before this era of NIL. But the thing he's always had in his back pocket is the fact that when you're as competitive and winning championships as he is, it's an easy sell in saying to recruits, come here, you'll have a chance to play for a national championship and win one. And oh, by the way, we'll send you on to the NFL as a first round pick, which they've done now for 14 years straight. That's been what he's been able to hide behind. The reality is there's probably a little more to this story. And, and I think when you're looking at the words of Jimbo Fisher, who you know, a spotlight's been shined on him because of what they did at Texas A&M, it's all above board. It's all legal at this point. Now, maybe not inducement is, which is obviously what he's been accused of at this point in time, but you know, Josh, if you ask people in the collective circles, everyone's saying at Texas a at least at this point, everything they did was above board. There's no harm, no foul. This is just one of those now bitter rivalries we got in the SEC West. Well, it's the, Brady, it's the whole thing about what is and what should be. Like right now, you look at it and you rightfully say, hey, they didn't do anything that they weren't technically allowed to do. And I've heard the same from those collective folks, which is a new term in and of itself in football that you've heard. Yeah, he didn't do anything that was, it was all above board. It's all above board. It's all above board is a phrase that we've heard a lot. When I listened to Saban last night, to me, I drew a distinction between, you know, what he thinks technically was allowed versus what he thinks should be allowed. And the bottom line is like, if you and I were out on I-95 down there in South Florida, and that sign says 70, and you and I both go 78. We look at each other, thumbs up. You probably got more expensive shades on than I do, but I thumbs up. We, we just go on about our business. Now, if someone flies by at 110 on a crotch rocket, it's a little bit different, and we look at him and we say, I don't like that. I don't even think that these guys doing 78 look at themselves as hypocrites when they call out the dude doing 110 is what I'm saying. And the other part of it is we had such a disproportionate landscape last year, state to state, what was allowed, what wasn't allowed. But ultimately, these guys agreed on the most important thing in the room. After all the bickering, after all the name calling, if you push that to the side, both of them, Saban last night, Jimbo Fisher this morning said, we need antitrust legislation federally in the room or else we're never gonna have control of anything. That was actually my biggest takeaway, believe it or not, out of this whole dispute. You know, the sad thing is, to that point, too, it's probably going to be something that's figured out in courts, not even necessarily getting the federal government to step in and do anything. And the reason why I say that is, look at the history of the NFL. It's always been antitrust lawsuits. It's always been the union and players versus the owners in order to be able to tread and get, make any ground in their CBAs or make any progress. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about essentially moving college football to more of a pro model, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. That's the direction that this is all going now that NIL is open and it's not going back. We're not changing from this path that we're on right now. So, you know, moving forward, I mean, you've got other collectives and people who have been uh, very outspoken about what they're doing because I think they're almost enticing someone to say, come challenge this. We already know what the Supreme Court ruling was. 
9-0. Come challenge this if we want to create more safeguards or guardrails to how this whole thing is going to operate at this point in time. I don't think you're going to see it. The only thing I'd say is this, though, to Nick Saban's point in regards to what happened in this past recruiting cycle. There is a little something to the fact that Texas A&M, after going 4-4 in the SEC in 2021, gets eight five stars when they didn't have eight five stars to in total the eight years prior recruiting. So there is a little bit something to that. I, I will say, I think Nick Saban maybe hit something on the head that maybe, you know, upset Jimbo Fisher. But the reality is uh, we'll see what this looks like in a few years. Because remember, Georgia had a couple number one classes. Mm -hmm. And who ended up winning the national championship this past year? Yep. And being Georgia Bulldogs, maybe he feels like after losing to AM last year, they're starting to kind of nip on his heels in Tuscaloosa. Highest ranked recruiting class of all time, according to 24 7 Sports. So, Josh, what is the fallout from this going to be? I think you watched a relationship dissolve. I mean, to Brady's point now, that wasn't born last night. Like a lot of what Jimbo Fisher referenced was one year old, five years old, in some cases 20 years old. So a lot of that was harbored. Man, that's some, that's some aged resentment. Like there's an old, old date on when that was born. It just all came out of Jimbo Fisher this morning. But yet, I mean, we've heard coaches snipe back and forth before, and yet you watch them, you know, all the media scrums around them, all the photographers are ready, and there they are midfield when they're about to face off, shaking hands. I think this is different. Like, I, I have felt out from both camps today, and it's a pretty mutual shared feeling that, yeah, this is probably beyond repair. Now, that doesn't really impact what's going to happen on the field. The football game will happen as the football game happens. But to this point, I think, I think Brady, you and I can both agree, there's been a pretty widely held perception that uh, A&M, maybe not this year, but next year. I don't think people are ready to talk about that anymore. I think people look at October 8th, and they go into Tuscaloosa. They just got it done last year with their backup quarterback, so no one wants to hear excuses about backup quarterback. They're going to circle that thing in bright red Sharpie. They're going to probably see Bama as a double-digit favorite if and when we finally get to that point. And yet I don't think anyone's going to be ready to say, Jimbo, just go give it a nice college effort. We don't really expect you to compete with this big bad man in Tuscaloosa for another year or two. I think all that's out the window, too. And Brady, to that point, I just wanted to throw this in. Sportsline already has points? a projected, yeah, is that what 16. It is? Yeah. Alabama 16 favored points. by I thought 16 I saw. points right now in that game. That's fair. I mean, that's fair. I think when you look at, um, obviously, they're going to rely heavily on, on some of the younger talent that they just got in this recruiting class to help provide some depth, maybe even some starting value there. Uh, but when you're looking at what Alabama's got coming back, granted, they always lose some pieces to the NFL, but they seem to reload. And they develop, and I think that's one of the things that gets under underlooked at or really undermentioned for Nick Saban's tenure at Alabama is overall development. He does a, as good of a job of anyone of taking a five-star player and making sure he gets to that first round when it's all said and done. Uh, look at the conversion rate for him, dra his draft picks and his recruits more than anyone else. So, you know, obviously the reigning Heisman Trophy winner is coming back. He's my favorite player to watch in college football. He's going to be a big part of it, but it's also going to be the other pieces. A guy like Jameer uh, get, uh, Bibbs, who's, who's coming in out of Georgia Tech, the running back, he's going to be phenomenal, I, I think, in this system, how they're going to utilize him. So 16 points. Seems like a lot. Sounds fair to me. Josh, October the 8th is the date of that game. What's going to transpire between Jimbo and Saban between now and then? I found it interesting when Jimbo flat out said this morning, he tried to call me. I let it go to voicemail. Like some of the people I despise, I don't even make go to voicemail. I'll just send them really quick. I don't make them hang on there for the four or five rings. And yet we also hear that, you know, Jim. Deion Sanders had no problem picking up the phone with Nick Saban earlier today. So my point is, there's going to be a whole lot of talk. They have to be in the same room less than two weeks from now in Destin for the SEC spring meetings, which to me, even though we don't get access to it, will be more must-see than media days because they're not even in Atlanta for media days at the same time. But I'll tell you what stood out to me the most. My first reaction was, I cannot believe Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, has not stepped in behind the scenes and gotten these guys back to their respective corners or at least taken care of things out of public eye. But then the more I think about it, Mike Slive, the former SEC commissioner, whom Greg Sankey learned under, probably would have done that. Greg Sankey, to me, strikes me as a commissioner more so than maybe any of his peers or at any point in the history of this sport that views what his product is as a raw form of entertainment. And sometimes if this stuff has to happen, it's entertainment, and at the end of the day, they're adults. You don't have to treat them as children. It's not a pre-K playground. You just let it be what it ends up being, and 
they've got to play each other. That's always been my philosophy about folks who run their mouth. As long as you've got to play them in the fall, you say whatever you want to in the spring because it will be settled on the gridiron. You know, to Josh's point, I think you look at the NFL model, they want to be constantly in the back of your mind, even in the offseason, right, as far as offseason, the draft, and then other news that comes out, and we can talk about that all day. College football with the transfer portal and NIL is starting to kind of venture into that, and especially as the recruiting cycle heats up with the early signing period. So you're getting elements of that, and I think college football is watching the NFL continue to grow, and as college, college football continues to grow and these TV deals continue to skyrocket and go up, you're seeing more and more people want to say, we can make these kids household names while they're in college to still build a build off their name, image, and likeness and build up their brand and build up our program as well. So this is a 24-7, 365 day a year uh, you know, watch for everyone, including the, the spring game and everything else that goes along with it. So it's almost like college football is taking a page out of the NFL's playbook in regards to how we're going to go about handling all these off-season issues. Yeah, I don't know if this, the, the whole NIL potentially pay for play thing, I don't know if that's good for, for college football and college sports right now, but what's happened this last 24 hours or so, at least it's in our industry, this is great. <laughs> it's given us fodder. We were going to be talking anyway, but we were going to be talking about other things. It's great for Pate State. It, it absolutely. And the Late Kick podcast, which is coming up a bit later <laughs> Look as well. Look at those hands. Hey, Pate, I'm a big Pate State Freight fan. Give us a paid statement for this mm -hmm. upcoming season. All right. Now, I thought long and hard about this. I've looked across the landscape. We have so many new coaches, first year at their jobs. I am ready to predict that a first-year head coach will actually make the playoff. I'm not ready to tell you which one it is because, well, the calendar says May, so I don't want to put myself that far out on the limb, but – I mean, Chris, Brady, like we look around right now, we can go anywhere from Lincoln Riley to Marcus Freeman to Brian Kelly. Dan Lanning at Oregon may actually have one of the best shots of any of them out there, and he's probably a sleeper candidate. We've also got Brent Venables, who is a preseason favorite in the Big 12. Uh, Lincoln Riley ditto in the Pac-12. So I just can't see a November where all of these guys are out of the picture. If Clemson doesn't resurrect themselves, what about Mario Cristobal with one of the best quarterbacks in the ACC and one of the best overall rosters, even in a down conference? You look on both coasts, Miami, L.A., Eugene, in the heartland, in Norman. I think we very well could see a first-year head coach in the playoff, which, by the way, will ruin this forever. For every new staff in the future, that fan base will point to this data point, if this does happen, and say, what are you talking about a rebuild? What are you talking about two years minimum? They came in and did it year one. Why, why can't we do it? That will be the worst thing to ever happen for future staffs if someone does pull this off. There's a lot of validity to that last part of what you just said, Josh. The reality is, though, you said it off the top. There are so many first-year head coaches that I can't let you off the hook with a paid statement like this. I need you to pick at least two. I'm only going to give you two. I know it's May. But this is the time when you make predictions. Like last year when I said Bryce Young was going to win the Heisman after the spring game for Alabama. I need you to come out, take a stance, pick one. I, I, look, I know who I would pick in this case because I think if Lincoln Riley doesn't win the Pac-12 and doesn't get into the college football playoff, to me, it's a failure. Everything that happened has happened this offseason, getting Lincoln Riley, getting Caleb Williams, all the other players, probably Jordan Addison. I, can I announce that now? Because I know he's picking between USC and Texas, but it's going to be Southern Cal. Let's just be honest Big about surprise. It. Huh? Okay? I'm saying if he doesn't, that's the one I'd be betting on. And in this case, only because of the entire situation, it's a huge disappointment for Southern Cal with everything that's transpired this offseason. Hey. Right? I um, Well, this is a disgusting tactic, but I'm going to go along with it. Okay, so I will <laughs> appease you. Ironically... I think we look to the, the, the softest of the Power Five conferences right now. I'm going to go to the Pac-12 where you went. I'm thinking about USC and Oregon. So you're giving me two at least. I'm going to take both of them in the Pac-12. I'm going to take either Dan Lanning at Oregon. Okay. Or I'm going to take Lincoln Riley at USC. The thinking there, of course, is maybe they meet in the conference title game. Maybe both of them are legitimate enough. Maybe Bo Nix does pan out as a legitimate, high-caliber transfer quarterback. And maybe... USC gets everything they thought they would get out of Caleb Williams, Travis Dye, Mario Williams, all those transfers. At the very least, I give myself two shots late in the year if that happens. Of course, Brady, we also know uh, I could be out of this by Halloween when I'm betting on the Pac-12 this heavily, but that's the state of predictions in the month of May. Well, how about this? Can we get a futures bet on USC and Oregon playing in the Pac-12 championship game? Now that we've done away with divisions, right. 
I'm with mm. you. <laughs> that, that's surefire the bet to make right now as far as a futures bet. Lay some money on Southern Cal, Oregon, playing for the Pac-12 championship. It's done. It's been decided here in May. Sign me up. Hey, yeah. Brady, this was history. First time that uh, you and Pate have been. I've been waiting a long history. time. For this. I think I gave him a hug in Ann Arbor. Is that when the last time I saw you? One of those Big Ten destinations. Yeah, and, I, and you did that just to stay warm because it was about 20 <laughs> degrees that day. So I only halfway <laughs> counted that. We'll make it happen again. All right. Josh Pate, thanks, man. Looking forward to the Late Kick podcast. So much to talk about. It's coming up tonight, 8 o'clock Eastern time. You can watch it live on YouTube and on Facebook. He'll have another episode on Sunday. It's two times a week this time of year. No offseason in college football. No, sir. N-I-L. Name, image, likeness. One of the main reasons Saban and Jimbo are at odds because... Well, it's turned into to pay for play in some cases, or at least a lot of finger pointing that it might be going that way. It's really turned college football upside down because name, image, likeness has come at a time where we have uh, the, a transfer rule where you can just, just about go anywhere and name your price at this point. Now, th this is, these are all estimated numbers. There's nothing set in stone that we know 100%. But according to ON3, Bryce Young's NIL valuation is over three million dollars. All right, C.J. Stroud at Ohio State over two million dollars. Several others over one million dollars. But again, we stress these are all estimates. We don't exactly know, and it, it's good for these guys to maybe inflate it a little bit uh, for their own. I'm not going to say egos, but maybe pocketbooks as well. Uh, let's let's bring in Brady Quinn on set with me, Chris Hassel, and Dennis Dodd. And let's talk NIL and how, how it has completely changed the landscape of college football and really fueled the fire that we've seen over the last 24 hours between Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher. Dennis, why do you think this has happened right now? I think it's just a product of, of everything right now. You've seen five prominent figures, including Gene Smith, Heather Like, the Pittsburgh AD, Jim Phillips, say out loud, that it may be time for football to separate from the NCAA, or at least football is too big for the NCAA to oversee. This plays into that. When they look at this, when they look at the fact that this week, you know, the, uh, Steve Berkowitz from USA Today put together the numbers. Over the last seven years, the NCAA has paid out $304 million just in legal expenses. That figures out to almost $5,000 an hour in the last seven years every day just for legal expenses. So when these people are saying this and looking at the state of the NIL and the NCAA, I think they're, they're saying out loud, I think behind the scenes, this thing has gone a lot faster than anybody thinks. And they've modeled this breaking away from the NCAA. I'm talking about college football. And then when you have Nick and Jimbo spatting like they're two schoolgirls on Twitter, it just, they go, look, we can do better than this. You know, we can set standards. The NCAA isn't going to, um, it may look a lot like this, but at least we'll have somebody overseeing it. As Brady has said, right now, there is no oversight. No, there's not. And, and those legal fees you're mentioning, they probably double if the NCAA tries to step in too much between some of these collectives and then how it's being managed right now, just because of the Supreme Court decision and what's been decided. But that's where we're moving. We're moving more towards a professional football model at the college level. And it probably would make sense for all parties involved in order to have the proper governance or guardrails, if you will, uh, for these universities, for these prospective athletes and then current student athletes in the game of college football. It's becoming too hard to manage. And, and here's the two biggest pain points with what's happened since name, image, and likeness has now gone into law. It's the fact that Federally, we don't have some sort of overriding law that allows all states to act equally. You know, for example, in the state of Ohio recently, they just voted down a bill to allow high school athletes to earn money off their name, image, and likeness. In the state of California, you can. What does that mean? Well, that means you can recruit kids differently. In the state of California, there's different things that you can provide for a player in high school than you can provide for a player in the state of Ohio. It creates an uneven landscape in that regard. And the reality is the NIL laws, even for the colleges, are different state by state. So it's impacted recruiting, and I think that's the crux of the issue in regards to Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher and their discussion about how that 2022 class came together for Jimbo Fisher, but also the transfer portal and the fact that you can now, because you're not penalized if you want to transfer, you get one freebie, and then potentially after you graduate, another one if you will, 
you can leverage your play on the field to an off the field deal in the NIL space at some prospective university. And the problem with that is inducement that still exists, no different than what we just talked about with the high school level, but also the fact of tampering. And that's really the crux, I think, of a lot of coaches, what they're frustrated by is you've got players, you've got coaches on other staffs that are contacting players saying, hey, you're not getting an opportunity there, or we've got something better for you here. Go transfer, put your name in the portal, come to us. That's the issue right now. That's probably my biggest problem with all of this is if you limited what athletes could do in the transfer portal, I think it would make some coaches, some administrators feel a little better about where we are with NIL because it's not going away. And honestly, it should be there for the student athletes. Well, that's that's part of uh, what people don't want to see is more restrictions on the student athletes. They feel like they should be able to go wherever they want because if you're just a random student at a school, you can do that. You can't even do that at the NFL level, though. No, and, that, no, and, that, no, and that's the reality can't. is no. the realistic scenario here. Because kids are graduating now after three years in college when you factor in the credits they get coming into college, summer school, and all of that at an accelerated pace. You could transfer twice within three years, change teams twice within three years, and be able to leverage that every time. And some people might say, hey, that's great, good, good for the kid, good for his family. Okay, but for every kid who does that, there's probably nine others where it doesn't pan out and doesn't work out. And that's the problem is we've, we've got to have the adults in the room make a decision that still allows them to profit off their name, image, and likeness, but puts in some guardrails, too, that protect against something like that scenario that we only hear about the good. We only hear about the big money dollar amounts kids are making. We don't hear about the, the bad stories where kids end up finding themselves without a degree and without much money in their pocket either. Well, Transfer Portal is becoming uh, more and more um, uh, in a, kind of an invasive species in, in college sports because it is all about, I mean, whether it's college basketball or college football, if you think you can make more money elsewhere, you're going into the transfer portal. If you think that you can go somewhere else and maybe put yourself in a better position financially or in the future financially, if, if you're looking at going to the next level in the NFL, the NBA, that's what you do. But we've got a lot of guys who have switched teams. Dennis, give me your list of players, or maybe it's just one, who's going to be the biggest impact transfer this season. I think Jermaine Burton at Alabama. They've had a breakaway uh, home run hitting receiver really every year since 2010 in Julio Jones. And I think Jermaine Burton is that guy. You can talk about Tyler Harrell, the transfer from Louisville, but Tyler Harrell isn't proven yet. And some may say Jermaine Burton isn't proven yet, but I think he's being brought in to be bred to, you know, bred to be that guy, to be the next Jamison Williams, to be the next, you know, home run hitter they've had there. And I did a story earlier in the year about how receiver has become not the, not the highest paid, but the second most important position on the field is Al and Alabama's had a lot to do with that. Um, from 2018 through 2022, they had five receivers taken in the top 15. That's unprecedented over that time period. Never happened before. Going back 25 years, Ohio State and Alabama had the most receivers taken in the first round. Uh, and until last week or last month, Alabama was the in the last 25 years, Alabama had the most first round receivers. Now, most of that's backloaded, but I think Jermaine Burton's going to be that guy. And I don't think the offense will be the same because I, I don't think they, they have the running back or the offensive line to grind it out like they have before, uh, maybe even a couple of years ago that they had uh, to do this. So they need to stretch the field. Obviously, every team needs explosive plays. And I think Jermaine Burton is going to be a breakout player this year. To me, it's Caleb Williams at Southern Cal. And the reason being is he's obviously one of the best players in college football. We got a glimpse of that last year, seeing him play at Oklahoma. But uh, this is really all about Southern Cal making the Pac-12 relevant again, making Southern Cal relevant again in college football. And he has all the ability to bring that and send a centered focus on the West Coast back into the college football elite. You know, he's the guy that's tasked with doing that, something that USC has not been able to do since the college football playoff has really been started and probably since Oregon the first year getting to the national championship game then Washington in a semifinal appearance after that that was it and really you could say after that first opening drive by Washington in that game that's pretty much been it for the Pac-12 so all of that weighs on the shoulders of Caleb Williams but he's very much up for the task he's obviously got a lot of talent out around him and he's an assistant that he knows very well with arguably the best play caller in the country in Lincoln Riley so he to me is the player that I think will make the biggest impact, but also needs to make the biggest impact. Did you say earlier in the show that anything short of a playoff appearance for USC would be 
underachievement in year Correct. one? Correct. I think it would be a disappointment. Like I'm going to go ahead and say that right now, at least in my mind, and look at the landscape of college football, and in particular the Pac-12. And I would have said the Pac-12 South if that division right. still existed, but they just did away with that in the Pac-12. So it's USC and Oregon, and I give the edge to USC. They've got just as talented of a roster, in my opinion, maybe not in the trenches, but as far as skilled players, they've got it. And they've got the best quarterback in that conference, one of the best potentially in the country. Obviously, a guy we're going to talk about up for the Heisman. So they should win it. With everything, they, all the money they invest in the Lincoln Riley and all the hype around it, if they're not, it, it can't be viewed any, as anything else than a disappointment. And Dennis, as Brady alluded to, the Pac-12 stepping forward, becoming the first conference to say the two best teams, the teams with the highest winning percentage, are going to be in the conference championship game this upcoming season and and we talked yesterday and and you said and I think Brady agrees all the conferences are moving towards this no division type crowning of two teams that go to meet in the conference championship game but how's that going to work with conferences with 14 16 teams like the SEC yeah the Pac-12 wasn't the first the Big 12 has done it for years the American did it during COVID but your point is well taken bit of guerrilla marketing yesterday when they dovetailed off the NCAA Council announcement to say, hey, we're going to do this, and it's going to be sort of awkward in 2022. They're keeping divisions. So a hearty congratulations to Utah as Pac-12 champs or Pac-12 South champs if Oregon and uh, USC play for the championship or something like that, or two northern teams play for the championship. Uh, they're going to get a nice going away trophy. But in 23... They will be playing in one division. I think there's a fascinating story ahead, not so much maybe with the Pac-12, but with the SEC, when they go to one division, and I do think they will, I think all 10 conferences will go to one division. How do you accommodate 16 teams with the infusion of Texas and Oklahoma, all those traditional rivalries, into, uh, you can do it, but how do you do it competitively balanced where somebody or another isn't complaining about it? I think that's going to be fascinating. Texas OU, you got to play. Texas Alabama, do you have to play that? Do you have to play LSU, Texas A&M? You have to play Florida, Georgia, Ole Miss, Mississippi State. When does that get in there? And they've got, they've got to decide, guys, if they're going to play eight games or nine games. One of the models I've heard is with eight conference games, one permanent game, seven floaters. Uh, with nine games, three permanent games, six floaters, where in a four-year period, everybody plays each other, which is a lot better than what it is now. I think Georgia has, uh, A&M's been in the league 10 years. Georgia has not been to College Station yet. Hey, by the way, hey, college football, get it together. All right, we're doing away with divisions. <laughs> That's a step in the right direction. Play nine conference games. I mean, it just, it makes all the sense in the world. Make it an apples to apples comparison. Why Stop not with play the 10? Play well, you, you could. I mean, the, the reason why you couldn't play 10 was because the Big 12 didn't have enough teams. You know, now, you know, it depends on how you're viewing the Big 12, given that Oklahoma and Texas will be leaving. Some people may be looking to say, are they really still a Power 5 conference if you don't have those two big brands that have been carrying the Big 12 for a period of time? Now, granted, with the influx of teams they've got coming, they've got enough to do that. But that was the reason why you didn't in the past, at least. Now there's really no, going to be no excuses moving forward. So they need to all at least play nine. I'm with you. I would say 10. The problem is then you miss those you know, non-conference big-time matchups or some of those layups like the SEC likes to do you know, during the course of November <laughs> at some point. When Bethune-Cookman comes to Correct. Tuscaloosa. Well, they got to get that November. paycheck. They, they show up yeah. and get the paycheck from the SEC school and take it back. But can that work, though? Uh, I just worry that you're gonna have, you might have two teams and one at the top that has a much easier schedule than maybe a team that finishes third or fourth when that, you have 16 teams in, in the conference. That's the reality of how it's going to work out regardless of the conference, though. I mean, think about it. Like, there's going to be years where you look at some of your elites, they're going to have an easier path, easier schedule than some of the other teams in that conference. It's just the reality of how this is going to shake out. It's one of the reasons why I think when you look at the construct of the Big Ten and how the Big Ten East, or and you could probably even make this case for the SEC with the way the SEC West yeah. have been so loaded, yeah. and then the East has been down, and in the Big Ten, it's been kind of the Big Ten West. We've seen Wisconsin or Iowa last year, but it's kind of the usual suspects. But whoever won the Big Ten East largely was going to end up winning the Big Ten championship. Same thing with the SEC West. You know, I, I think now you're with your doing away with that, maybe you get a different mixture of teams actually playing for uh, that conference championship. But I think there's also the likelihood that you get a lot of repeats. You know, we, we might get a scenario where we see Ohio State-Michigan play Ohio State-Michigan again yeah. the following week. And I think that's one thing that adds intrigue to it. 
but could be wearing after a while. Okay, well, interesting stuff. Pac-12, uh, basically scrapping divisions, maybe not for this season, but moving forward, the divisions really don't matter other than scheduling for this upcoming season. The teams with the two best winning percentages will meet in the conference championship game. Dennis Brady say, uh, expect all the other conferences to follow. All right, taking a look at the schedule for SEC Media Days, and we are going to get uh, Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher in the same town, hopefully in the same room soon, and see what happens. That's coming up very shortly next week for some meetings there. These are the media day schedules for uh, mid-July when they will not be in the same place at the same time. Alabama goes Tuesday, and then Thursday, Texas A&M goes. We'll have all your coverage from uh, the College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta. It was an off-season dominated by the coaching carousel in college football. But who are the players that are favored to win the Heisman this upcoming season? The two clear front runners for now are also two names that might be called early in the 2023 NFL Draft, C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young. While the Buckeyes missed out on the college football playoff for the first time in three seasons, Stroud was everything Ohio State hoped he would be, throwing for 44 touchdowns and just six interceptions. C.J. Stroud strikes for his sixth touchdown pass of the game. And he won't have to wait too long to make a statement this season, with Ohio State opening up against Notre Dame at the shoe. In Tuscaloosa, Bryce Young will attempt to become the first player since Archie Griffin to win back-to-back -back Heisman trophies. 55 yards! What a throw! What a catch! And while his supporting cast may look a little different, the Crimson Tide are once again loaded with talent. Circled in burnt orange, a week two meeting in Austin. The first time Texas and the Tide have matched up since Nick Saban won his first natty with Bama. Out in SoCal, Oklahoma transfer Caleb Williams will be reunited with Lincoln Riley and the new look Trojans. I'm here, I'm a Trojan, and I can't wait to get things going. Expectations are already sky high for the true sophomore, who will have intriguing talent surrounding him as he tries to lead USC back towards college football's elite. Will one of these three quarterbacks take home the Heisman? Or will there be a surprise contender few see coming? It might only be spring, but college football season can't come soon enough. 100 days away from college football. I'm Amanda Guerra. We are bringing back Brady Quinn here. So we're going to talk about your pick to win the Heisman. So last year, Bryce Young yeah. ran away with it. He is yeah. not the betting favorite as of right now. Wow. That is C.J. Stroud. So you said... Many months ago, Bryce Young could go back-to-back. -back. Are you sticking with that? Who's your pick to win? I'll, I'll stick with that because I do think he's the best quarterback in college football. Uh, you don't have to look very far to put on the tape. And as good as Jamison Williams was, there was also the way Bryce Young was making some of these throws last year. And, and I get it, Evan Neal was a tremendous player, first-round draft pick, but their offensive lineup front for Alabama had some issues. And Bryce Young covered them all up with his ability to move, improvise, extend plays, and find Jamison Williams downfield, or John Mechie for that matter, whoever it was. But he's got a unique talent and ability to just make something out of nothing. He's a good decision maker, and he can make all the throws. He's not the biggest guy, but he's got plenty of arm strength to do it. He's accurate at all three levels, deep, intermediate, and, and short. So I'll go ahead and double up and say right now, you want to bet? It's Bryce Young. Now, again, C.J. Stroud, with what he's got coming back on his roster, makes a lot of sense, too. I think he's got a little clearer path, too, for Ohio State, playing in the Big Ten. Uh, that's not going to have Aiden Hutchinson, you know, playing across from him at Michigan. But the reality is I'm still sticking with Bryce Young. You always have great names to keep an eye on. Is there potentially a long shot that we should just put in our back pocket? I like Jackson Smith and Jigba. And it's one of the reasons why I think C.J. Stroud is the favorite right now because that's who he's going to be throwing to. And, and I think common logic would say, well, if Jackson Smith and Jigba is having a big season for Ohio State, which he already did last year, which puts them on the map, the reality is C.J. Stroud's probably also having a big year. Here's the difference, though. It's the way Jackson Smith and Jigba gets those yards. You can move them around, put them outside, put them in the slot, put them inside, and find unique, unique ways of getting him the football. And it's the yards after the catch that's so impressive. And one of the reasons why, too, where I think when you go and break down the tape, a lot of people are going to come away enamored with what he's capable of doing, and maybe he steals some of those votes from C.J. Stroud. So if you're looking for a long shot outside of any quarterback position, uh, he'd be one guy, and then obviously Will Anderson, who I'm just going to go ahead and say right now, if Bryce Young's the best quarterback, <laughs> all right, 
Will Anderson's the best player in college football. He should have gotten more credit for what he did last season. All right, those are your picks. Uh, potentially to win Heisman and to keep an eye on there, a long shot. Taking a look at the odds, though, where they stand right now, C.J. Stroud, as we mentioned, Brady said he may have a little bit of an easier path uh, to this position right here. He is the favorite, the betting favorite at plus 300, followed up by Bryce Young and then, of course, Caleb Williams in his new home of Southern California in not Oklahoma. For changes feet and Georgia is crowned the national champion for the first time in 41 years. Georgia's 41-year title drought ended as the SEC's dominance continued. Three different SEC programs have won the last three national titles. And while the Dogs lost a record amount of players in the NFL draft, they have three more potential top 10 picks on defense along with quarterback Stetson Bennett, who returns after a career-defining performance in the national championship game. I'm certainly glad that we won it. I'm glad we won it for our fans, but I'm focused on forward. You know, I'm looking like in there, not in the rearview mirror, looking out the windshield right ahead. But the favorites in the SEC reside in Tuscaloosa. Big surprise. The Crimson Tide appear ready to make another run at a national title behind Heisman Trophy winner Bryce Young and superstar edge rusher Will Anderson. Perhaps the two best players in all of college football, coached by the greatest coach in college football history. I thought we had a good spring. We had a lot of guys make a lot of progress. I think we know what we need to do. But Texas A&M may have had the best offseason as Jimbo Fisher signed the highest ranked recruiting class in college football history. Might that be enough for the Aggies to finally supplant Alabama in the SEC West? We'll get a much better idea early in the season, October the 8th, when the Aggies and Tide meet up in Tuscaloosa following AM's stunning upset last season. In Gainesville, the Gators hope to have the breakout player in the SEC as quarterback Anthony Richardson tries to take his game to the next level under new head coach Billy Napier. Nice wall, big dog. Hey, right here, Anthony. Good. Good. That a boy. Good. And in Baton Rouge, the Brian Kelly era begins with much anticipated fanfare and high expectations. We know it's hard work. We know there's great teams in the SEC. We respect them, but this is LSU. Go Tigers! The rich get richer, and the SEC just keeps getting better. Storylines aplenty as the conference goes for a fourth straight national title. You know, when we wrote that, we had Chris Voice said we had no idea of the future and the drama to come in the SEC. Uh, Brady Quinn back with us. Let's welcome in college football expert Barrett Salee here. All right, guys, let's start with Alabama. They are the favorite to win the SEC. They're the favorite to win the whole shebang here. Uh, but the SEC specifically at minus 140. Brady, you agree with that? Yeah, look, they're the favorite. If you want to lay a futures bet, I'm all for laying some money on Alabama. There's nothing like an Alabama team that feels like who a team they beat in the SEC championship game end up losing to in the national championship feels like it's going to be scorched earth this season for the SEC with Nick Saban and his uh, returning Heisman Trophy winner Bryce Young. And as we talked about there in the preview, Will Anderson, who may be the overall best player in college football, but it's also what they did in the transfer portal. When you pick up a guy like Jermaine Burton, who along with the rest of their weapons on the outside and JoJo Earl and Ja'Cory Brooks, those guys can all take the top off of the defense. And we know big plays have been part of the formula for success, but don't forget about Jameer Gibbs, who they get from Georgia Tech as well. He'll add that dynamic ability that they really didn't have last year in the backfield to go along with all the other talent that this team possesses. So rightfully so, they should be the top of the SEC, and I think they will be when it's all said and done, Barrett. Yeah, Brady, I agree. I mean, Occam's razor, right? The simplest solution is the right one. You're starting out with the two best players in college football and Bryce Young and Will Anderson. You have the best roster or second best roster, depending on what happens with the transfer portal from here on out. Nick Saban has done a great job supplementing that roster, filling those holes. I think when you look at Jameer Gibbs, he might have the best season of any running back in college football this season. And so, yeah, I think you have to go with Alabama. No disrespect to Georgia. I think Georgia is going to be just fine, but... 
Stetson Bennett, not necessarily a liability at quarterback, but Bryce Young is a difference maker. And then defensively with all the players that got drafted from Georgia, it's hard to imagine them consistently keeping teams behind the chains, at least as well as much as they did last year. So yeah, I'm rolling with the Crimson Tide this year. I think uh, it's they're, they're the favorites for a reason. Those big buildings out in the desert weren't built on bad lines. All right, let's talk about the playoff then, Brady. I assume Alabama will be there for oh, yeah. you. Uh, walk us through who you have making it to the playoff and any surprise teams. Uh, Alabama, Ohio State are, are the top two, in my opinion, based on the quarterbacks, what they have coming back. But I threw in Georgia in there in part because, look, Kirby Smart's done a tremendous job in recruiting, and I think they do have some depth there. You've got a quarterback in Stetson Bennett who he may not wow you, but when he needed to most, he stepped up in some big spots in the national championship game. And so I think they're up for the task. And so let's just call it the loser of that SEC championship game. Potentially still gets in. What about your Oklahoma Sooners? 35 to 1 odds. <laughs> I, look, I'm just not win. buying in yet to the Texas hype. You know, is Texas back? And we got to ask ourselves this every single year. So I, I, I got to see it to believe it. I think Brent Venables has done a good job of providing a little more energy into that program. You hear the players talking about it. Don't uh, sleep on Dylan Gabriel either, the quarterback. So I like Oklahoma through a clear path through the Big 12 to find its way into the college football playoff. I was surprised when I saw that. I'm not angry about it. I appreciate you. For, <laughs> I very much appreciate it. Uh, Barrett, give us yours. I, I don't think Oklahoma made the cut, no, though. No. No, it didn't. But, I mean, good job by Brady not buying into the Texas hype. Nobody should buy into the Texas hype and say that Texas is back until Texas actually hoists the college football playoff trophy. Then Texas will actually be back. But like Brady, I've got Alabama 1, Ohio State 2, uh, Georgia number 3. I think they'll lose the SEC championship game, still get into the college football playoff. And then number 4, I'm going to go Clemson. I know they're a little off the radar this year because it was a down year by Dabo Sweeney standards. It really wasn't a down year all that much. DJ uh, Uyunglele just wasn't ready. He's lost 25 pounds. He's more athletic. They're going to get involved in the running game in a variety of different ways. But Brady knows this. The games are, are won and lost in the trenches. And while, yes, offensively, that might be a, a concern for Clemson, defensively, you're going to put this defensive front up against some of the best that Clemson has ever had. So yeah, the coordinator changes, certainly something to monitor, but when you can roll too deep along the defensive line and you play in the ACC, then you're in a pretty good spot. So I think Clemson gets in uh, at, at the number four spot. I wouldn't be surprised though, if you're talking about Ole Miss and Oklahoma State in there, sort of on the brink, uh, you know, closing in on the top four spots. All right, let's talk about Ole Miss here for a little bit uh, because we're going through a bet that should be placed right now. I am not good about placing bets this far into the future, but I know I can make a lot of money by doing that. So what bet should we be placing right now? Yeah, Ole Miss over seven and a half regular season wins. And, and when you're looking at some of these, you have to factor in schedule. Obviously, it's a huge deal. Their toughest out-of-conference game is at Georgia Tech. That's four wins right there. Their permanent cross-division uh, opponent in the SEC is Vanderbilt. It's on the road, so their other cross-division game, their rotator is Kentucky, which is at home. Now, Kentucky's going to be pretty solid, but still, that's a pretty easy draw. That's six wins right there. And then... A couple of them are toss-up. I'd say at LSU is a toss-up. I'd say at Arkansas is a toss-up. Mississippi State, a toss-up. I'd go so far as to say even Texas a and is a toss-up. That's a lot of wiggle room for you to get to over seven and a half wins. So I think the out-of-conference schedule, the fact that Lane has hit the transfer portal, uh, portal uh, not only a lot, but very, very well this offseason, and the fact that some of their tougher games cross division aren't as tough as maybe some other teams will get them to eight wins. All right, let's talk about week one, though, Brady. What bet should we place for week one? I love Purdue taking on Penn State at home, and they're a three-point dog. Take the points. Take Jeff Prom, Brom and Purdue. We know they love upsets to start off the season. This is one where it feels like Jeff Brom and Purdue are building some momentum. Nine wins last season. It's the most he's had during his tenure there at Purdue. They've got eight starters coming back on defense, a defense that only gave up 22 points uh, per game last year, and Aiden O'Connell. Keep an eye out for this young man. It's a prolific offense. They've got a couple transfers to replace what they may be losing in Milton Wright, who's not eligible due to academic issues, but he's going to be a high rise. When we start talking about quarterbacks in the 2023 draft, keep an eye out for Aiden, uh, Aiden O'Donnell. O'Connell. I'm telling you, he's going to be the guy that's going to start you know, turning some heads, I think, in Big Ten play and creating an upset right out of the gate in West Lafayette. 
Barrett, 100 days away from the beginning of college football. Week one bet here. You're looking to a certain quarterback uh, continuing to rise to the occasion. No pun intended. <laughs> no, literally, pun intended. I see what you did there. Unintended. Cam Rising for the Utah Utes. Plus one and a half going to Florida. Utah, I think people forget, they're a really good team. Consistently a top 10 team. In fact, some of these way too early top 25s has Utah in the top five. And you're telling me they're going to be an underdog in the swamp against an, a Florida team that, yeah, while talented, is nowhere near where it should be. Dan Mullen neglected that team from a recruiting standpoint. So from a pure talent perspective, you think Pac-12 versus SEC. Oh, my gosh, the SEC has the advantage. Not really. Not in this one. And when you look at what Utah is built on defense and running the football, they absolutely can do that. Tavion Thomas is back and on a mission as well at running back. So I'll take Utah. You can grab the points, but I don't think you need them. It's only a point and a half anyway. I think the Utes win outright. I love this bet by Barrett, and it's important because week one, you get a new head coach in Billy Napier, too, kind of taking over, still trying to you know build the culture, build the program. It will be a physical battle. You better put mm -hmm. your big boy pants on when you're playing Utah. So I love this bet. It's a sneaky good one. Get it in now before this line potentially changes so we get closer to the game. I love that we had a whole hour dedicated to college football because it's been a hot minute since we've been able to do that. <laughs> Brady Quinn, Barrett Salee, thank you guys so much. 100 days until college football. Make sure to download and follow the Cover 3 podcast. Latest episode there, by the way, this is your home for everything college football. Latest episode, of course, reaction to the drama we didn't know we needed. Nick Saban's bombshell comments and, of course, Jimbo Fisher's response. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.